Hi, we meet again. We are at Unit 3, Lesson 2. In this lesson, we study covert action, historical evolution, justification, requirements, approval, issues attendant to them, ethical dilemmas to consider, who has oversight of covert actions in the U.S., and we look at two lessons learned, a failure, Iran-Contra, and a success, the assassination of Osama bin Laden. Then we conclude. The National Security Act defines covert action as an activity or activities of the United States government to influence political, economical, or military conditions abroad, where it is intended that the role of the U.S. government will not be apparent or acknowledged publicly. Covert actions are controversial by their nature. They are also known as the third option. The first option is doing nothing about a political or security problem at the international level. The second option is sending military forces into areas where vital interests of the U.S. may be threatened. The third option is in between doing nothing and going to war. We look at the historical evolution of covert action in the U.S., beginning with the Cold War with the Soviet Union, with a special focus on the Eisenhower administration, where covert actions became increasingly attractive and were thought to be and used as a useful tool in international policy. In the post-Cold War period, covert actions became the preferred means of action against specific targets, such as WND proliferators, narco-traffickers, transnational criminal organizations, terrorists, Al-Qaeda, and its affiliates. During the Carter administration, covert actions were known as special activities. This administration had profound reservations about the use of force as a diplomatic tool. Covert actions at this time are best represented by Operation Cyclone. This involved the arming and training of Afghanistan's Mujahideen by the U.S. government. This is also known as the Charlie Wilson's War. During the Reagan administration, covert actions were used to roll back Soviet influence in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Roll back replaced the containment policies, particularly of the Eisenhower administration, and are best represented, represented by Iran Contra. The Clinton administration is claimed to have had aversion to covert action. This is why it is claimed that this administration did little or nothing against Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. During the Bush administration and in response to the attacks of 9-11, the global war on terror was launched. This meant that the U.S. government took the gloves off and Covert operations, particularly involving rendition, were used. During the Obama administration, covert actions have been used to take the fight to Al-Qaeda. It's best represented by Operation Neptune Spear, which involved the assassination of Osama bin Laden in May of 2011 at Abu Dhabi in Pakistan. The justification for covert action should take place only when tasked by duly authorized policymakers of the U.S. and specific goals cannot be reached by any other means. Under no circumstances should a covert action be a substitute for poorly conceived policy. No viable method in the absence of other alternatives to our specific objectives should exist other than a covert action. This means that covert action should be the only alternative available
to achieve an objective. And at no point should covert actions become a permanent war by covert means. Justification also includes the clear definition of a national security interest at stake and an assessment of the relative risk compared to that interest. A high-risk operation may be worth undertaking if stakes are high and no viable and actionable alternatives are available. I suggest that you focus on viable and actionable. Here is the example of training and arming Afghanistan's Mujahideen. The U.S. armed rebels with the Stinger missiles to fight the Soviet Union's invasion. However, the Mujahideen turned into the Taliban who struck against the U.S. I am sure part of this happened because the law of an of unintended consequences was not taken into account when planning these activities. The requirements for covert actions must be focused on the fact that it takes time for a covert action to be fully operational. Covert actions operate over vast geographical areas, therefore they cross borders and other countries must be involved. They require specialized training, large infrastructure, massive logistics, coordination among agencies and countries, false documents, and the utilization of foreign assets. The operational support known as plumbing is time consuming and involves the consideration of costly factors such as prearranged planning meeting places, secret and classified locations, the use of surveillance agents, operational environment reconnaissance, letter drafts, and technical and specialized support. That includes the deployment of special operations commanders and the use, and the use of drones, particularly in last years. Cover actions require formal approval from the executive branch a presidential finding issued by the President of the United States must be obtained. This sign order approves the operation based on findings that the covert action is, one, necessary to support identifiable foreign policy objectives of the U.S. The focus here is unidentifiable. And secondly, that the operation is critical to the national security of the U.S. The executive branches prepare a memo of notification to go to Congress and the Senate and House Intelligence Committees become involved. Also, the findings, the pros and cons of them must be given to those responsible for executing the operations. Approval also includes the consideration of levels of risk. The first one is exposure. It always should be assumed that an operation will be exposed and can be politically embarrassing. This is the case of Iran Gate, which involved the arms transfer to the Ayatollah Khomeini, and failure, which often includes the loss of lives and political crisis for the nation carrying out the operation. This is the example of the Iran Contra, which delivered a big black eye to the Reagan administration. The philosophical issues involved fall under, the, under three categories. The idealist perspective that holds that covert intervention by one state in the internal affairs of another violates norms of international law and conduct. The pragmatic perspective holds that self-interest of a state occasionally makes covert action necessary and legitimate. And the third option holds that these actions are illegitimate but are often used. Issues also include plausible deniability, which is a questionable excuse for using covert action. The Church Committee defined plausible deniability, but I am focused on the operative part of that definition. 
in the case that illegal or otherwise disreputable and unpopular activities become public, high-ranking officials may deny any awareness of such act or any connection to the agents used to carry out such acts. The issues also involve, involve blowback. Blowback refers to a story planted in overseas media justifying the operation, but that story is reported back to the U.S. The operation is misrepresented in the U.S., and this misrepresentation misleads policymakers and the U.S. public. And the operation may have involved outright violations of international law. And worst of all, the operation compromised other overseas operations. Assassination is usually part of covert operations. The Church Committee reported in 1975 that it had found concrete evidence of at least eight plots involving the CIA to assassinate Fidel Castro from 1960 to 1965. Since 1976, the United States formally banned the use of assassination directly or indirectly or through third parties, assassinations by the U.S. government. And President Reagan emphasized this ban in 1981. During the global war on terror, assassination became part of the war specifically against jihad. During overseas contingency operations, which is how covert operations were known between 2011 and 2013, they were approved and executed against those who presented significant threat to U.S. interest. They were executed mostly against adult males in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And since 2013, when the U.S. entered the end to perpetual war, covert operations and assassination are executed against those who present a continuing and imminent threat to U.S. persons. These individuals appear in what is known the kill list of the Obama administration. The ethical dilemmas confronted in covert operations relate to how covert operations fit the Constitution, laws, standards, and principles of the United States. All of this must be considered a priori, meaning when the operation is being planned or prior to, pl to planning it. And they respond to this question, does the end justify the means? Is this action an extraordinary step between peace and war? We need to keep in mind that assisting independence, insurgent, revolutionary, guerrilla, and our side, and our side movements is dicey because alliances shift, as it has been shown during the Arab Spring. We also need to remember that financial covert operation to disrupt foreign economies hurt innocents and the world economy. This is the boomerang effect because the global economy is totally interrelated and interoperative. The ethical dilemmas also include consideration that outcomes are usually difficult to assess and the opera operationalization of success must respond to these questions. How useful is it? How critical is it? will achieve the operational objectives? Are there any human costs? And is, is there appropriate consideration of length and duration? And I believe that to these questions, we need to ask consideration of unplanned consequences. The law of unintended consequences must enter into this consideration. Who has oversight in the U.S.? Congressional committees are an integral part of the oversight of covert actions. Congress must be informed by the executive branch, the office of the president, 
but it does not have approval roll. The approval remains with the president. Congress's funding is important, but it is not mandatory, as it uncontra approved. Then, if funds exist and there are no specific obstacles to cover action, then all the agencies involved are good to go. The lessons learned. The ease of getting caught up in the now leads to overlooking lessons from the past. Therefore, we have to ask these questions. Has it been tried before in this region or nation? What were the results? Were they positive? Were they negative? What were the direct and indirect costs? Who bore them? What were the risk factors? Are they different now? What makes them different now? What can, could, or might change? In which direction? I believe that if these questions have been asked and answered to truthfully, the Bay of Pigs operation will have not happened, or if it had happened, will have been planned and executed differently. Here is an example of failure, the Iran-Contra affair. Questionable delegation of authority that order and manage covert actions were a characteristic of this action. Oliver North, a military aide in the NSC, was the key person in charge of the operation. Presidential findings were postdated and pertinent documents were destroyed or hidden regarding the sales of missiles to Iran. Disparate operations were merged, using Iranian money to fund the Contras, and the executive branch failed to keep Congress properly informed. Here is a success, the assassination of Osama bin Laden. The justification for it was globally accepted. There was a clear identification of the objective. There was no ethical ambiguity. The coordinations of the agencies involved was flawless. There was a successful allocation, utilization, and deployment of needed resources. This was a high-risk action that achieved all its objectives. In conclusion, where are we today in covert actions? A report produced by the Congressional Research Service mentioned that the Department of Defense may have been conducting certain kinds of counterterrorism intelligence activities that will statutorily qualify as covert actions and thus require a presidential funding and the notification of the Congressional Intelligence Committees. The report also points out that some of the DOD's activities have been described publicly as efforts to collect intelligence on terrorists that will aid in planning counterterrorism missions to prepare for potential missions to disrupt, capture, or kill those terrorists and to help local militaries conduct counterterrorism missions. The report also mentions that the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence expressed concern that the distinction between the CIA's intelligence gathering activities and the DOD's clandestine operations is becoming blurred and called on the DOD to meet its obligation to inform the committee of, of such activities. Concerns were raised about the program. This is the cover metadata collection conducted by the NSA since 9-11 to monitor communications among U.S. citizens in U.S. territory and their counterparts overseas. The focus here is their counterparts overseas. In 2014, the Obama administration pledged to transfer some covert activities of the CIA, particularly drone missions to the DOD. However, the transfer is still a work in progress. What did we cover in lesson two? We covered covert action, 
historical evolution, justification, requirements approval, issues, ethical dilemmas, oversight, and we look at two lessons learned, Iran-Contra and the assassination of Osama bin Laden. Thank you for attending the lecture. I wish you the best of success in your continuing studies. We will meet again in lesson four. Thank you.